Welcome to CSCI 591 Colloquium on Monday, November 12, 2018. I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, special CS curriculum. And today, I have the job to introduce our speaker because I know the speaker almost 30 years ago. And we went uh, to the same place, Carnegie Mellon, for our graduate study. And since then, we've become very close friends. We have a lot of shared interests. And Professor Ren Shi Wen, he, I call him professor because he was the professor at MIT, and then decided to move to industry, and then move to government. Now he is with a very large government research institute called NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology. Since I know him as a personal friend for so long, I don't even know what his current position, so let me read it to you. He is the chief of the software and system division, of the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST. Now, Ren has been working, although his background is in engineering, but he has been really working with a lot of issues in information science, information technology, and, uh, this, and also a lot of different applications in industry, health cares, many different things. So whenever he has a chance to come to California, I always wanted to bring him to campus, let our students to enjoy also his very active and successful career. And today, I believe he's going to share with us some of his uh, perspectives about uh, some very important technology, artificial intelligence. And I'm pretty sure everybody will enjoy this discussion. And uh, I think afterwards, you can have some discussion with uh, Ren Shiren. OK? With this, let's welcome Dr. Ren Shiren for today's talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, two corrections to what you just said. Actually, I know him for 38 years, <laughs> not 30 years. I don't want to and, uh, yeah, <laughs> and I'm with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Okay, although we do a lot of science work. So what I'm going to do today is uh, you are all uh, senior, I mean, uh, senior students, graduate students, combination, everything here, I guess. Or, okay, so we can. No, I have a lot of slides here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, the slides will be made available to you all, so you can look at it later on. Uh, so what I'm going to do again is to do this exploration. Artificial intelligence, as you all know now, is big in the news. Uh, if you have a degree, if you have an expertise in AI, it's also likelihood that you're going to get a big, fat job, a job with a big, fat salary out there, too. But uh, we have started, in fact, uh, Stephen Liu and I have started this around 38 years ago at Carnegie Mellon. That's where it all started, and I'll talk briefly about historically what I have done and what we are doing right now and what goes on to the future. Uh, so I'll give you a very brief, how many of you have know about, uh, actually, let me see, how many of you know about MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology? Probably everyone, okay? That's where I taught before. What about NIST? Some of you maybe. And some of you probably even Googled me before I came. You know, if I'm going to sit there for one hour, I need to know who this guy is, okay? Have you Googled? No? Normally, they do Google, okay, <laughs> and find out who the speaker is. Anyway, so that's what it is. Remember, Google will come back to that later on. Okay? Uh, so I'll just briefly give you about uh, what NIST is. Uh, it's about, it's a, a part of Department of Commerce, and uh, we promote U.S. innovation and uh, industrial competitiveness uh, by essentially advancing measurement, science, standards, and technology. Really, it's, that's why it's National Institute of Standards and Technology. Now, we actually, uh, this is a little bit outdated in some sense in terms of uh, uh, the uh, budget issues. We're almost a billion-dollar budget, but we have about one, two, three, four, five Nobel Prize winners. Uh, four of them at NIST and one who did his work at NIST. So we are a Nobel Prize winning organization working on stand measurements and standards. And if you have seen the recent news about kilogram, now of all the basic units, kilogram is the only one which is really physical now, and that's going to be uh, uh, electronic uh, in terms of measurements of uh, quantum. If you know what a Planck's constant is, now you can convert that into the, uh, the uh, be used at a standard for, for a kilogram. So even the notion of kilogram is going to change in the future. So this is a basically briefly our organization, and uh, in fact, this changed a little bit around here. We have a new director and things, I mean, uh, Walt Coven. Uh, and uh, there are about seven labs. I'm with the Information Technology Lab, and I'm, the, I'm heading the Software and Systems Division. Very briefly what our organization is. I don't want to go too much into it. And my particular division is called Software and Systems Division. And the way that we look at our divisions is that we always look at why, how, and what. Why? Why means what do you do? What's my purpose? Do you have a purpose here? You have a purpose here, right? Get a degree? No? Actually learn? No? What's your purpose here? Just since you're students, okay? 
You have a purpose. Yeah. yeah. What's your purpose of coming here? So you want to get a PhD, okay. So your purpose is not to change the world. Your purpose is to get a PhD, not to influence the world. Like ask Stephen, what is his purpose? He says, I want to change the world the way things. Purpose. He doesn't talk about university education. He didn't talk about money. He talks about how he changes the world. So that's what we talk about. And he talk about SK, he does the same thing too here. He says, how do you change how people think about manufacturing? That's what I want to do. I just don't think comes. So, and then this, how we do it is we, uh, we work on various aspects of standards and technology. And then we work on a number of applications around here, as you can see, uh, there are number, uh, digital forensics, healthcare, biosciences. So I'm not going to go too much into what we do. You can go through the website and look at it. And there's a number of ways you interact with us. We have guest researchers who come from all over the world who end work with us uh, for periods of time. Uh, we give small grants to the universities. At one time it was good, but now it all depends on the, what happens outside uh, in the Congress. Uh, we actually have faculty members coming and working with us for various periods of time. We have a faculty program where people actually, faculty members from all over the world, are in the United States come. Then if you're a U.S. citizen, we have a very nice program called the NIST, uh, National Research Council Postdoctoral Program we have. And uh, after PhD, if you're a U.S. citizen, you come and spend a few years with us uh, doing various kinds of things. Uh, then I also have a summer students. Like if you are an undergraduate student at USC and would like to spend the summer now and actually get paid for it, we have a summer student program. No restriction on the citizenship, but you know that's a good program we have, and we can talk about that. Uh, now I'm going to talk briefly about what AI is, since uh, some of you are students. Uh, there's a lot of things about artificial intelligence right now. It starts with the definition of intelligence. And normally people ask, you know, you ask people, you know, what is intelligence? You have a notion of what intelligence is. And you have a notion of what intelligence. And all of you have notions of what intelligence is. And the dictionary kind of gives what notion of intelligence is. It's the ability to meet uh, uh, and deal with uh, uh, situations successfully by proper uh, adjustments. And people give a number of attributes to intelligence, and we're not going to talk about all these things in general, but you have having mental attitudes, perceiving and modeling the external worlds, understanding things, solving, ability to solve problems, that's in, innovativeness kind of comes into picture when you're talking about problem solving, and in fact, you are, Stephen, you teaches a course on in global innovativeness kind of thing, so it's all part of intelligence. And actually, the interesting part of it is that if you look at carefully here, uh, uh, multi, uh, Howard Gardner, in fact, wrote a book called uh, Frames of Mind, I Believe, and it talks about multiple intelligences. Intelligence is only not a single dimension of your ability to solve problem, but it's all multiple dimensions. So when people talk about now artificial intelligence, it is not just that thing, that particular program is going to learn or recognize your faces and things like that, but there are other aspects of this intelligence people need to look at, not just the aspect of the things which what Google does with images and so on. So there's a lot more to intelligence than that. So it's a kind of simplified view of an AI, and the idea is to emulate the intelligence of humans, whatever you think is the intelligence of humans. Now we are trying to emulate it, and that's what artificial intelligence is. And again, remember, there are multiple dimensions to this part of it, okay? Now I'll briefly talk about the evolution of artificial intelligence, and I kind of um, uh, uh, categorize it, or at least divide it into a number of uh, phases. First, I call it the prehistory of artificial intelligence. In terms of the prehistory, we have the Paleolithic and uh, Neolithic kind of thing. In terms of the Paleolithic, there is the Indian and Greek philosophers who talked a, thought a lot and lot about that, probably nothing else to do in life. They thought, they thought a lot about how knowledge is represented, how reasoning processes happen, and if you go very much into the Indian philosophies and the Greek philosophy, you can know they have learned, and Chinese philosophy too, I guess, in terms of Confucius and things like that. There's a, people have talk and talked a lot about the philosophies and the notion of knowledge representation. And then in the Neolithic, I call Hume, Russell, and Turing, and these guys also talk about machines and how machines can be made more intelligent. So that's a little bit of prehistory. Then there was a beginning in 1956 where the term AI was, con was coined at uh, the Dartmouth Conference, a number of famous people like Simon, uh, Newell, and all those people were there at that time. So the next stage is called the early years, which goes from about 1957 after the word was coined to until about 1980. Uh, again, there's a lot of activity going on. General Problem Solver, Drendrel from Stanford, Hearsay from CMU, which was one of the first systems which actually where you can do connected speech. Uh, Maxima, Mycin from, again, uh, expert system for uh, medical uh, diagnosis. And there were robot, robots also like Shaky is a robot at uh, Stanford Research, SRI, Stanford Research International. Uh, then, of course, in 1980s, we have this notion called the knowledge is power, and that's what uh, there is a guy named Kaifu Lu Lee, 
uh, who actually is a venture, venture capitalist now from Chain, he's written this book which just came out and everyone talks about that book nowadays. And he kind of talks about waves of AI and the first wave, wave of AI is 1980 to 1990 which Steve and Lou and I were involved at the time. We were just starting our careers at PhD students at CMU and the right time to get in because all the stalwarts were there and we call that as a first wave and it's basically the whole thing is to do about knowledge representation in terms of rules and some early work of neural networks, Jeff Hinton was teaching at Carnegie Mellon at the time and, they, and he was a, a pioneer of neural networks and so that was going on at that. Then there was something called the silent period from 1990 to 2000 where things were happening like the deep blue is a chess system which beat the, beat the experts and the rise of the robots and number of commercialization of AI technologies happened like for example Kafu Lee with his pings uh, was, I think it was Sphinx, Sphinx was a system that he developed at CMU and there's a lot of, and again, uh, Raj, Professor Raj Reddy was a pioneer in speech processing. His students, Jim Baker and, uh, uh, and his wife started this thing called Naturally Speaking Dragon. So a lot of speech processing systems, uh, speech recognition systems were became, or be getting commercialized as such, okay? And they recognize various accents like my accent. So those are the kinds of things that happened uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so, uh, to 2000 or so, and then suddenly in 2000, this whole thing called something called deep learning came up, and they call deep learning because of deep neural networks. Neural networks, in the nine, when we learned about it, at three layers: the input layer, the hidden layer, and the uh, and the output layer. And then, as computers became faster and faster, they started putting more and more layers in between into the thing. So then you get you have this thing called deep neural networks, and they could do very nice things. They could recognize faces, and even if the, you know, you wear a cap, you wear goggles and things like that. What's your name? Yes. yes? Okay, now Ash became all the, I'm not take, picking on you, but since you're in the front row, Neil, next time I'll pick up on you guys too, okay? <laughs> Just, so anyway, so, you know, for example, if Ash changes his face, I mean, uh, uh, he goes a longer beard and motion things, so the system still recognizes that. And they're very good at certain type of problems called classification type of problems. So about 2015. And now what's happening is that now you have this thing, a symbiosis, symbiosis of, both neural networks and knowledge networks, and that's what we're going to see in the next 10 years, or whatever, next five or six years, where you're taking neural networks and taking the best of both knowledge networks or a knowledge-based representation, which uh, Stephen here knows very well in the 1980s where they were doing a lot of work at Illinois on, on using knowledge-based systems for design. And then what's happening is that these AI systems, one of the things that, that's, that's a problematic with AI systems is explainability. They don't explain. If I ask Ash, how did you solve this problem? Maybe you can explain how you solve this problem. But if I ask uh, uh, the AI system, it doesn't know. Oh, I just recognize the face. But what made you recognize, say, it's a cat or a dog? So it doesn't know what to do. And that's explainable AI is a big thing right now. Open knowledge networks is to have open knowledge, like in Google, for example, when you type something, it has a net knowledge network behind that, and that's why it's trying to help you to fill up uh, what it's expecting right now. In fact, Google now, they become pretty smart. Even in email, it'll ask you all kinds of things. Uh, and if you send attachments to people in Google, actually Google reads those attachments, by the way, okay? And it, uh, uh, like for example, one day my son was coming home, uh, but he was his air flight was delayed. And he never told me anything else except he sent his itinerary as an attachment. And Google somehow or other figured out. And around five o'clock, I get a message saying that you know this flight is delayed. I said I never said Google and gave it anything. How does it know? They read your attachments and they figure out that why would the guy send a file itinerary to you? So the only way they're sending an itinerary to you is that he's is coming in the flight and that flight is delayed. At least let me know. I don't need to wake up at five o'clock and go. So these are the kinds of things, and it's pretty bizarre right now, but it's happening. And I call it as a third wave. And then the fourth wave is a tsunami wave, which I'm predicting, where there's something called the conscious machine, like AI as consciousness, AI as all kinds of things, this machine, it's going to the bizarre things that are gonna happen. That's in 2025, you don't need to worry about it. Some of us may be there, may not be there, okay. So in terms of the key topics in AI, uh, there, are, uh, there are various, uh, they can do, you can do a lot of things. Anyone taking a course in AI here? Artificial intelligence, no? The rest of the things, technology. The number of aspects of AI, knowledge representation, problem solving, machine learning, you know, in terms of deep versus uh, symbolic, again, in 1986, 87, some of uh, Stephen's PhD students worked in this area, machine learning, but I don't know, they didn't call, they might have called it machine learning at that time. Uh, that was kind of innovative at that time, uh, but then suddenly everything kind of, I think he moved from Illinois to here, and. <laughs> left the machine learning part away, but then machine learning kind of came back right now in the symbolic machine learning. There's a whole lot of natural language processing, perception, robotics, so these are the kind of areas right, which are very, uh, where people are doing all kinds of research, I think. 
So, and within the problem solving, we have what is known as a derivation formation type spectrum, which I call. And in the derivation type problems, what happens is you do classification. Like, for example, the neural network is going to classify whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. So this is the classification type of problem. So if something happens to your car and you take it to a mechanic, the mechanic has to diagnose it. And they say that, well, uh, the, you're out of gas or whatever it is, the carburetor failed or something like that. This thing failed, that thing failed. And there's a diagnostic type of problem. You go to a doctor, the doctor will, based on your symptoms, tell you, you know, either you're suffering from uh, malaria, diabetes, or whatever disease that you're suffering from. This is a derivation type problems. And then you go to the other end, this is a tough part of it, is the formation type problems. And design is a classical example of it. Because in design, you only give the specifications and you've got to generate the solution. So design, configuration, all those things are, yeah, even if you are configuring a, a plan, for example, of how a robot should act in a manufacturing plant, all these things are formation type of problems. They're a little more difficult to do than the classification type problems. So around, uh, these are some of the things that I did uh, uh, it, when I was in MIT, in terms of, uh, I wrote a book on intelligent systems for engineering uh, in 1997, which talks about you know, how you can apply this whole technology in the engineering field. Uh, then in 1992, we came up with a three-volume series on artificial intelligence in design. And in 86, we founded the Artificial Intelligence in Engineering Journal. I mean, actually, it should go from 86, 92, 97. So I mean, I've been pretty active in AI for the last four decades or so. Uh, 86 is the one, uh, first time I started this journal. That's almost about 30 and odd years ago. So, okay. Now, at AI, at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the recent past has, uh, is, is, is getting more and more involved in the AI aspects of it. In fact, we have got some congressional money uh, to do work in AI. And the key, key things we are interested in, two aspects there. One is the trustworthy AI. How can you trust this AI? It's all about trust. You know, the system comes up with some answer. It says, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you have uh, uh, macular degeneration. Uh, so then how do you know I have macular degeneration? It says you have lymphoma. How do you know I have lymphoma? How do you trust this system in the first place? Your doctor you trust. Can you trust the system too at the same level? So that's uh, one of the major things that we're interested in. And we, when we are a uh, standards uh, place, we measure things. And we stand, when you develop standards, not develop, actually participate a lot in standards. So how these are the two aspects uh, at NIST and, uh, uh, that, that we are interested in. Associated with that, there are things of privacy, security, explainability, resilience, and reliability. So these are all the kinds of things, uh, that uh, dimensions that we work on. And these are the applications like Internet of Things, robotics, material science, manufacturing, biomedical imaging. These are all the examples of applications. So there is a trustworthy AI, it's measurements and standards. Then we have the dimensions, as auxiliary things like privacy, security, all these things become very important in AI, with some applications like IoT, robotics, material science, and things. And that's what NIST does. So there's a thing about measuring AI trustworthiness in terms of probabilistic data driven uh, and so on. Uh, so this is what our five-year goal is. Again, I'll send you the slides. Uh, we have a number of activities going on at NIST. Uh, in applied uh, ML by AI. We also look at uh, foundational research. Then uh, we look at evaluating machine learning and AI technologies because we are measurement agencies. Now, a lot of times when people talk about measurements, they talk about measuring uh, the length of this, maybe. Measuring the weight of this, maybe. Measuring how much uh, kilograms, uh, maybe. maybe. Time is a measurement thing. So these are all measurements issues, but these are in the physical world. Now, you got to see, figure out what is it to measure in AI technology? What is involved in measurements of AI technologies? So that's the kind of things that, that, that we do at NIST. So then finally, we kind of look at standards. And associated with standards, we are talking about interchanging knowledge of presentation and so on. So now I'm going to talk about my journey of AI in the last uh, 35 years or so I've been in. I may not be able to do justice to all of it, but I'll uh, talk, to, talk about some of it. Uh, talk about life in 1980s. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, some explorations in machine learning. Then we talk a small project on natural language processing. I call it Google to Panini, and you'll see what it is. And then finally, we talk about category theory. So my journey really started in 1981, 82, uh, when at CMU, we got a project to develop a knowledge-based expert system. I'll briefly talk about it called Atlanta People More Project. Uh, then 82, 86, I did my PhD at CMU, worked on All Rise and Destiny, two uh, expert system kind of tools and for design. Then I went to teach at MIT from 86 to 94, 
where uh, then I got the idea of that internet is going to take over the world. And trying to, at that time in 1986, trying to explain people what internet was not very easy, especially to civil engineers, because I was in the Department of Civil Engineering. <laughs> and then I went to NIST uh, and uh, uh, you know, it, uh, in a, uh, advice of one of my friends who's actually at university, at university of uh, California, San Diego, Professor Pradeep Koshla. And uh, then uh, my PhD advisor, Stephen Fenves, came from CMU to NIST, and we worked on uh, the CPM and extensions. And uh, uh, Professor Gupta here actually was involved in a number of those projects when I was at NIST from 1994 to 2011. And then from 2011 onwards, we work on machine learning, natural language processing, and knowledge representation. So in terms of knowledge, see, the thing is uh, the, the people mover project, the uh, problem was the following. So uh, how many of you kind of, when you go to the airport, for example, you go in the train, and there's no person there. Remember, you go from one terminal to another terminal. There's no one in there. Have you observed that? There's no one. It all moves automatically. Okay. So in 1980, Westinghouse was the one which used to produce these things called people movers. So they had a problem. The problem is there was no one in there. And the system was kind of going, and occasionally it used to have problems like the door, door open when the system was running, and you're not, not supposed to do that. Sometimes the doors were closed, but the system thought the doors were open. There are all kinds of problems were, were happening. So what they did was they came to Carnegie Mellon University and said, hey, you guys are great in expert systems. Why don't you develop, uh, uh, help us with that thing? So, it is, so what we did was, like uh, this is a people mover kind of thing where the doors open, close, and things like that. So they came to us. And at the time, the primary mode, uh, as I said, the rise of the expert systems. So expert systems were the major uh, AI systems that were being developed. And they really looked like this. There was a knowledge base of long-term memory. There was a short-term memory. There was a context. And knowledge was represented in rules, frames, and so on. And this one had uh, these various inference tra strategies like backward chaining, forward chaining, constraint propagation, and so on and so forth. Okay? And so we developed this system in 1982 for first implementation was in a, a domain independent system because you need a shell uh, where you just put in the rules, uh, which was called KAS, which came out of another system from SRI called uh, uh, Prospector, uh, something like that. And that was in the domain of geology. So the only problem with that is they took out the, all the domain knowledge in there, gave us the shell. Occasionally, it used to ask questions about stones for whatever reason, whatever domain knowledge you put in. It wanted to know something about a stone, but well, that's a different issue. There's some remaining knowledge. So a very powerful system. So there was a system that we used to develop it, and this is the report. And unfortunately, what happened is these reports we couldn't publish because it was distributed limit, lim, limited. And although it was, we did a lot of innovations in here, like model-based diagnosis and those kinds of things, we couldn't publish because of the contract with Westinghouse at that time. Uh, but there are lot, lots and lots of innovations in diagnosis at that time, uh, which were done in there. And then we had to get the information from the sensors too. So it was re-implemented in something called PDS. Now, interesting story is the following. So we developed the system. And uh, we went to Atlanta to demonstrate it to the uh, president or vice president of Westinghouse who came and sat there. And uh, he looked at this thing and said, it was very slow, by the way. You're talking about 1980. This was 1982 or something like that. We demonstrated it to him. Internet was really slow. Things were taking a long time to answer. And all. he didn't really care about it. But what he said was, he said, yeah, this is a great system. Now, if I give you a million dollars, can you develop the whole system in nine months? And you know, that time, technology, everything was slow. And I think, how can we develop those? Because you have to get the knowledge from the experts. And there's a lot of resistance from the experts. They, didn't want, they thought they are going to lose their jobs if you can get their knowledge out and incorporate into the system. So it was a good exercise. So in, then I went and got my, then in uh, 1980, I started doing my PhD in 86. I finished my PhD, and we developed this system called Destiny. It's actually your integrated structural design system. Since it was my destiny, I named it Destiny. And the way the destiny, uh, the, the, thing, the way it came out is that my PhD advisor was uh, Stephen J. Fenves, uh, but there was Professor Raj Reddy who was in the computer science department who developed the system called Hearsay. And Hearsay is a speech understanding system, except in Hearsay what happened is you go from signals, that is I'm talking right now, and you can get the uh, output in terms of signals of the speech, and you convert into some symbolic structure, and the system can tell you what I'm saying right now. Now, Raj said, here, 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 we developed this thing. Now, this looks like an interesting paradigm. Why don't you try and do it for design? So I said, well, it's an inverse process around here. In inverse process, I know the top level kind of specifications, and I need to come up with the bottom level components here, which I call the signal, and how do I go about doing it? 
and I came up with this uh, blackboard based system which is very similar to hearsay in copy wise except that all the domain was engineering and things like that. So that was the system that was developed in 1986. Then in uh, uh, this thing uh, which I said all rise, all rise is actually a domain independent system for doing design. Just like we can put domain knowledge into CAS and get an expert system for diagnosis, you can put domain knowledge in all rise and get an expert system for design. So that's why it was one of the things that I had to do in this uh, journey. Uh, then we had this uh, in 86, I went and joined, took a position at MIT as an assistant professor and uh, then we came up with an uh, uh, then I was looking at what I should be doing next. So before I do uh, say anything, let me just briefly talk about design. Uh, design actually starts with customer specifications for those of you, either you are in the software or engineering. Those customer specifications have to be converted to engineering specifications. And those engineering specifications, the idea is the internet thing. We're going to put it on, on the internet somehow. And the first stage is to put all this information in the design evolution database. And uh, there's a workflow associated with it. So in, the, in this whole stage, when, the, when you take the engineering specifications, you have to convert that into some knowledge-based uh, uh, design activity, uh, so, so into, into a conceptual design. And that conceptual design is a knowledge-based activity. And uh, this, was a, this slide was done in 1992 after that, after I left MIT anyway. But uh, look at this. This was Alan Mulally. Alan Mulally was the guy who headed this Boeing 777 project, I guess. And then uh, he went to Ford and uh, uh, changed the whole, for, uh, made Ford very profitable and so on. So very famous guy, but he was an engineer at that time. And here is what he has to say about uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the 1990. Now, computers don't design airplanes. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have not put the knowledge that's in the airplane designer's head into artificial intelligence that balances all these objectives. Uh, someday, uh, uh, we'll continue to probably move to that uh, end, but uh, right now the knowledge to design airplanes is in the designer's head. Okay. Now, you said that in 1992, but the question is that we are now 25 years later. What is the state of the art? People are still having problems, and computers actually didn't design automatically. This, they made some advances. And the idea is that a lot of the knowledge, uh, pieces of design are all over the world. We're talking about a global design around here. Now, Volkswagen does something. Actually, Ford at that time was a a multinational company that, I guess they had Jaguar at some point or something like that, okay? So designs in Jaguar were different than designs here and so on. So they had to deal with all of them. So put it in a design repository. And uh, then this is what people used to do a lot called traditional CAD. It's called final element method and so on. So some of you are engineers, you know what this is. And then you do, sorry, this is the traditional CAD. It's like SOLIDWORKS. Final element analysis was done. And there's this whole thing called virtual prototyping environment. In other words, I take this and put it in a computer and when I put it down, it, it actually falls to the gravity and so on. And all of them can be. And uh, finally, the other stage is this uh, immersive CAD, where the interface, the silicon uh, and the carbon interface is very symbiotic. So that's one thing about gameplay, games. You know, are you all play games here on, on the computer? Uh, I, I, in fact, two of the most widely used applications of computers are word processing, just like what you're doing, texting. I'm not just kidding, okay, <laughs> and uh, our emailing or whatever we do, our writing documents. And number two is uh, the uh, video games, because the video games, you're involved in the computer as such, okay, you're part of the computer. And so we, you learn a lot from video games, actually. In fact, you can do entire simulations, simulations of the manufacturing floor, simulations here, simulations there. The video games are actually an interesting paradigm, totally. I don't, it's not very much, I don't, still don't understand why people don't do too much work in this area, but it, you should, it's a prime area. Uh, so in any case, now all these things are connected to other kinds of networks and things like that. So I'm just going to skip this. There are a number of areas involved in this. So that's a kind of a design network involved there. And one of the aspects of this design, again, is all knowledge-intensive kind of activity. So uh, if you talk about uh, computer-aided design, computer-aided engineering, and so on and so forth, you have several aspects. And this is true with healthcare, you do with anything. So you have input, where you have to input things into the system in a user interface manner. Uh, it's kind of interesting, like, for example, almost all the systems I see are Macintoshes. I don't see too many PCs around here, but uh, you know, I guess see, most, most of them are Macintoshes. Why? In fact, the user environment of the Macintosh itself is, is, is very interesting. And the other thing is the storage, like whatever knowledge or whatever things you generate here have to be stored. It has to be persistent across uh, for a uh, CAD diagrams now about 70 years, for the healthcare also 70 years or so. All this information has to be stored. Uh, and then there's, we do a lot of things like uh, decision making, simulation, et cetera, and et cetera. 
a lot of AI again goes into this picture, into this whole thing. And finally, we have this manipulation where you search, mine, and create knowledge within this ecosystem in design. And there's a lot of AI in each one of those things which happen in terms of mining the knowledge, in terms of creating new knowledge, and so on. So artificial intelligence plays a huge role in that. And finally, when you're talking about heterogeneous systems, when you're talking about globally distributed systems, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, both the syntactic and semantic interoperability, a lot of work which is done in AI knowledge representation can be used around here. Uh, so this is like, for example, from design to manufacturing. And there's a lot of people who are working around this in the 1980s, Stephen Luce group at uh, Illinois Urbana Champaign at a big program in this area where they were talking about very similar ideas, but in, I was doing in civil engineering and he was doing in the mechanical engineering, but ideas were very, very similar in these things. Such. And security is a final thing. At that time when we did security, it was no big deal. <laughs> no one cared about it. Now everyone cares about security and privacy. And those are part of it. Even in manufacturing, security, as, as SK, Professor SK Gupta here can tell you, that uh, there's a lot of issues in terms of security and privacy on his manufacturing floor, and people are interested in that. Because even rapid prototyping that you do, actually people can eavesdrop uh, you when you send messages across to the printing uh, rapid prototyping machine, and, uh, and, and they can recreate your design. So the traditional view of product data at the time was it was all geometric centered. For those of you who know about uh, uh, Copernicus and Ptolemaic views, this was a Ptolemaic view, uh, and everything was geometric centered, and, all, and everything is around that. Uh, but now we actually have a different uh, notion, a paradigm shift. It's all about semantics, and the rest of the things are around the semantics as such, and that was the thing that we uh, proposed in the late 19, 18th, 18, 1980s and 1990. And even if you take about the kind of information that evolves in this computer through the life cycle of this design, as you can see that depending on which part of design you are, your representation changes from linguistic plain English language like of things to uh, basically some pictorial representations. Uh, sometimes uh, you have ontologies around here. Uh, and then you can, you can see that different kinds, wherever depending on the very dif different parts of the design stage, your knowledge representation also evolves and changes over the time. And uh, this is what uh, at MIT, we worked on this thing called DICE, called Distributed and Integrated Computer and Engineering Environment. And we called it DICE because people told us that it's a very ambitious project and a gamble. So we said, okay, DICE is it. And uh, the way it works is, again, by the way, now what has happened is into the internet, all these things have become cloud-based right now. So people talk about cloud-based manufacturing, it's all in the cloud. And then you can deal with security and how you manage the cloud, how do you transfer information in the cloud and so on. So here I'm going to talk about, actually that's me with Heron. Uh, this was 1993. And this is a system that we developed at MIT, and I'll show you a brief video on that. Of a system like this developed in our laboratory, the system is called Shade. Let's have a look at the video. You'll see an example here where the architect now is designing the spaces. Now in this case, the architect has come up with the central core, those are the red things that you see, and some workspaces. In the next view, you will see that the architect, once he finishes this, is committing the transaction. By the way, these are all on different computers. And once the architect finishes the design and posts it into the databases, the structural engineer gets a message saying that uh, the architect has posted something into the database. The structural engineer now retrieves the information from that particular database, and then the structural engineer goes ahead and does the design. In this, you'll see the structural engineer's workstation, where you see a different view of the design. Previously, you saw the spatial view. Now you are seeing the wide frame view, and uh, are the structural engineer's view. And the structural engineer here is designing a slab, and you can see the slab on your left hand, uh, left corner, and note that. This, uh, well, there's one line jetting out of that slab, and that is for pass-throughs. Now, once the structural engineer has finished, so here the, the representation is uh, mixed representation. The you have lines, the, you have planes, you have solids. The now it's got a non manifold representation. Now, once the architect gets it, the architect now decides to. Now, the architect immediately sent a note here. That something, someone has made a change, and you, you are the seen. one who's responsible. So the for architect it. is now putting a an equipment on that slab. However, that equipment is qualitatively placed. So there's no geometry here. You just put the equipment there in a qualitative location. manner. So the architect takes the equipment and places it on the slab, and you will see, see how that is done 
in the next visual. You can see the equipment that is a small rectangle on that slab that is being generated. And once the architect finishes his design, you can, you can here is a zoom in of that where you can see the equipment area that is the area for that particular equipment. The structural engineer gets back the message and the saying that okay, here something is put uh, placed by the architect. The structural engineer takes that and here is a constraint violation. It is, tries to design, but there is a constraint violation. So the idea is so that the you're, you're, engineer does the both are cooperating together on the system, slab. and some violations now happening, constraint violations, the because shot, the the that particular thing which the architect did, slab. which is not there very is good for a structural engineer. View. So As you those can things see are done. That we now can you all use Facebook. From the solid no? to the white. So in Facebook, exactly that's what happens. You know, you post something in there, it tells you all the people who are there, and it recommends you all kinds of things. And this was all done in 1992, except for the wrong audience, engineers. So, Mr. <laughs> Here, the structural yeah. engineer. So, is anyway, just, this, this kind of goes on. Okay, so I'm going to. And once the structural engineer uh, finishes. So, now how did we kind of build this whole thing? This whole is a huge system. It's like a, but a Facebook like system for engineers. It's pretty big. It requires a lot of things in there. And AI played a big role in the thing. Uh, we have this thing called object oriented blackboard. Uh, so, these are all the contributions this made. Uh, symbol to geometric mapping. Now, the, the issue was that, like, symbolically, it generates a design. Uh, something is next to something, something is over something, and so on, and that has to be translated into geometry. So mapping from symbols to geometry is not a very, it's a cognitive, pro very complex process as such. Then we had all this multimedia conferencing and things like that. Uh, uh, we had an object-oriented rule engine. I'll just go briefly describe this particular system around here. At the lowest level, we had this uh, distributed object-oriented management system. For those of you in computer science, you know what that is. And then we had this thing called Cosmos, which we developed over it, which could do forward chaining and backward chaining is that inferences kind of thing and it, inferences can be done over this large number of objects and this constraint management system that you have seen uh, it, there's something called a non manifold geometric modeler uh, which we developed over it and there's a lot of knowledge representation in terms of this shade and there's a system which did, uh, did uh, design given a set of specifications automatically came up with the designs and then you did conflict uh, management and design rational so uh, in terms of uh, the object representation, we came up with this uh, way of uh, object representation with the objects had this OID, VID, and then it had this uh, set of tuples, uh, uh, which we'll come back to that again later on, uh, form, function, and behavior, and there's some methods like if I send a message to an object, the intelligence is itself in the objects, as such, that's a key thing. The objects have intelligence encoded in it, and they can do all kinds of things. And you can, uh, this, and I, I'm not going to go into details of this because you can just get the slides and look at it. But it's a knowledge representation scheme, and this is how the geometry was modeled, and this is, the, this is how the qualitative spatial relationships were modeled. Because I have to put that slab, that particular uh, equipment on that slab, and uh, it is on something, so that then needs to be represented. You know, how is, this is all represented in a symbolic manner, where I have this floor system, there are beams, slabs, and columns, and this particular beam one is symbolically represented and qualitatively represented in terms of what it is doing with respect to slab and so on. So you have to have now qualitative algebra and qualitative constraints that need to be satisfied. Not only the geometric things which people do all the time, but you also have to do qualitative geometry and you combine both those things in there. And in terms of the intelligence in the object, as long as I said change something in the structural beam component that had the intelligence and rules associated with it, saying if you do something to it, and if these are the things that happens, then I, I, I notify the appropriate owners. And that's exactly what Facebook does right now. Like when you post something, it asks you where you tag people, and it knows who are the people whom you are tagged and sent it. And they do something more too. They do all kinds of other kinds of inferences in there where they want to know your patterns, and they'll see what else you're going to buy and so on, and they give you some advertisements and things. And Yahoo also does the same thing. If you click on something at some point, and a few days later you kind of know, it says this particular system is on sale at Amazon for a lower price or something like that. Now all those things are, these are the, this is how they encode them to the thing. And so in 1992, I speculated the fact that if you want to do anything useful or machine learning, you got to have this comprehensive knowledge base for engineering. And that was a time when I proposed this comprehensive knowledge base would consist of various layers around here, and the top layer is the knowledge editing tools, and it, they layered by layered by layered, and this is what people are trying to do right now in terms of representing knowledge and then build, build layers and layers of this knowledge to the thing. And that's the single most important thing is how do, you, how, do you rep, how do you build all these layers of knowledge? I mean, the world is full of knowledge. There's lots of knowledge that is being generated. If you go to Wikipedia, this knowledge, that knowledge, all of, how do you represent that is the question. 
And uh, you know, we wrote a book around 2002 on our experiences. All these are on public uh, ring. You can get a free copy. It's called Distributed Integrated Collaborative Engineering Design. So, and then in uh, 1994, I kind of moved to NIST because people at MIT kind of, I, I couldn't convince them that this is the way the world should go. So I left and went to NIST. Uh, since it's being recorded, I can't say too much more. <laughs> I went to NIST where uh, then idea is now, since it's a standards organization, how do you standardize this entire knowledge of presentation? And uh, uh, we developed this uh, whole thing of representing form function behavior as a form. And also you need to develop, develop a function. So we came up with some techniques for representing function of all these mechanical devices or electromechanical devices. So you have a knowledge representation for that thing. And this whole thing became something called the functional basis for design. And a uh, uh, number of people like Wood and a uh, student, I think Rob Stone, who's now the division director at NSF, all these people kind of uh, uh, took over this thing and developed uh, uh, tons and, and did tons of work over it. So this was the basic fundamental basis that was developed at NIST in 1995 or something like that. Okay. So then we have the form and function. We were uh, then we developed some uh, uh, again from a knowledge representative pers uh, representation perspective. We developed all these uh, key entities that are required for doing function. Again, the mechan and then this whole product whole product model can represent electromechanical devices. And again, uh, since in the interest of time, I'm going to go just skip through this whole lot of slides. Uh, we can, you can look into this thing later on, the core product model. And uh, then we developed an assembly model over it where actually electromechanical assemblies can be represented right now. And again, with uh, uh, Professor Gupta and his students, we developed a number of extensions to these kinds of things. So I'm going to skip this assembly thing because I know, I know how many mechanical engineers are here. And then people took this thing and applied to uh, from the University of Wisconsin, they took this and applied it to materials and how can you represent materials, especially the uh, heterogeneous materials in there. Again, they used extended this core product model. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, Professor Gupta and his students have done a lot of extensions to that and a number of other people have done extensions to this kind of a thing. So then uh, uh, that is for the products. Now we got to represent the processes too. So we developed a representation language called process specification language for representing processes. Now we have the products. Now we can represent the process. Again, this is all in the area of uh, knowledge representation at this stage. So a number, I tied a number of activities. So I'm, I'm going to skip that. So now I'm going to talk in the next 20 minutes or so in terms of uh, what we are doing right now from 2011. I moved from, I was in the engineering lab at NIST, then I moved into the computer science division, and these are the kinds of things we are doing. So there are a number of things we are doing in terms of AI here. One is AI for metrology. So we are trying to understand how, so there are two things here. That is, if you talk about metrology, it's actually measurements. So how can you use, use artificial intelligence techniques for improving the measurement science? That is AI for metrology. Then we also work on other things called metrology for AI. So how do you measure AI? How do you measure artificial intelligence? What is intelligence? What are the metrics for measuring that thing? That's called metrology for AI. Now, this is AI for metrology. I'll give you an example of this AI for metrology later on, but this is some of the things that we are doing uh, of using artificial intelligence for uh, measurement science. The other one, uh, again, is uh, related to that is AI and machine learning for uh, uh, image processing techniques. And uh, here we are using advanced uh, high performance computing to achieve the same thing uh, with some examples later on. Uh, there's a lot of work we're doing on natural language processing. Uh, here, here, the domain here is uh, materials. It's a material genome initiative at NIST. And uh, here the goal is to use machine learning uh, techniques uh, for uh, analyzing large documents as such. And uh, one of the things that we did is we analyzed a collection of almost 66,000 AI-related conference articles to determine uh, the extent to which ethical concerns related to a set of ACM principles uh, are being addressed by the AI researchers. Uh, so now, the, what's the impact? For everything we do, we need to be an impact. And the impact here is that uh, useful knowledge from unstructured scientific data uh, is useful uh, in situations where training data would otherwise not be available. So that's the impact kind of thing. Then uh, I, I'll talk briefly about this natural language processing for such. Again, here the idea is to use uh, uh, neural networks and symbolic processing for terminology uh, generation, information indexing and searching documents and clustering documents. Again, this is what something which uh, Google does. Uh, then uh, there is uh, there's a whole lot of uh, literature on proteins 
in the healthcare in the health in the bioinformatics world. So we developed a system called uh, uh, Pi, which is actually uses machine learning te techniques to kind of extract the protein-protein interaction uh, things from the uh, from these uh, documents. And if you go to this website around here, it's actually available there, and you, you can give the document. You, you can do all the searches uh, through this thing, so you can. Uh, uh, take this PDF documents, you can give n number of PDF documents, and it will output what are all the protein-protein interaction sentences in there. Okay. So you can go to NIH site, and it's available there free. Uh, then the issue is that now I talked about metrology, uh, AI for metrology. Now we go for metrology for AI. How do you measure things? So one of the major problems we have with the software, you all write software around here? Uh, software of bugs, don't you? Some people claim it's a feature. No, it's not a feature, okay? Like you tell you, go to your professor and says there's a bug in there. No, no, it's a feature. I put it in there. I can't buy that. Okay? It's not a feature. It's a bug. So now we're using artificial intelligence techniques to kind of figure out how to detect these bugs in the source code automatically. Okay? So that's one of the projects that, uh, that you work on. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, some of the things we're doing, uh, some applications in this thing. Uh, this particular project is, again, for metrology. Uh, sorry, uh, AI for metrology, and uh, the way uh, the project goes like this, okay? On this side are the biological pe biology people, on this side are the computer scientists. Now, here the biologists and the computer scientists work closely. Now, in this case, for example, they, we, if you take uh, stem cells, you must have heard about what stem cells are, you know, use stem cells and create all kinds of tissues and things like that. So, we take the Petri dish, the microscope, actually, the cells are growing in that. The colonies are growing in that. And you can take the microscope in there. And the problem here that is you cannot actually get the entire uh, uh, field of view there for analysis, only get parts of it because they don't have enough uh, processing speed. So the idea then is to now develop a system which can actually scan this Petri dish as the stem cells are evolving, the colonies are evolving kind of thing, and kind of predict which kind of stem cell colony is good so that that can be implanted somewhere? In this case, it's macular degeneration. We'll come to the example uh, later on. So the idea we do is that the biology people actually do the, uh, the experimental design, specific, specific specimen preparation and things like that. They send us the raw images, and we do the stitching, just like, you know, if you take panoramic kind of things on an iPhone, we have to stitch also around here, and the stitching is pretty complicated. You need to do those kinds of things. And then what we do is that we do this segmentation, tracking, and evaluation, all this feature extraction, and this extraction is done uh, automatically. And again, this is where AI comes into the picture as such. Okay, so we can do automated extraction. We give it to them, and then they again send it back here and so on. And the process goes on between us and them. And finally, we kind of, uh, the confidence is that in, in their systems are improved quite a lot. So AI and machine learning plays a big role in these things. Now, one of the examples here is the age-related macular degeneration. Okay, so where you actually macula is the place where uh, your uh, uh, the, the light focus on that macula before it goes into your brain. So some a lot of people have this age-related macular degeneration. In fact, my mother had, and what happens in that thing is that you don't see the central view, only see the peripheral view. So in fact, this is what they see. Okay. So for that, now they, what they have is that they have stem cells transplantation, transplantation. Except the problem is that these stem cells that when you go from this Petri dish, uh, you have to pick up the right colony as such. If you don't do it, you're going to implant the wrong stem cells into your eye. So to do what we have done it, because of based on our experiments, we have shown that you can actually predict which is a stem cell which is good, uh, stem cell colony which is good, and you implant that in your eye. As a result of that, you can, uh, uh, you know, you can get 20-20 vision around here. Instead of just this kind of vision, you can get this kind of vision. And this kind of impact, we always look at impacts excuse me, in whatever we do. So we call, collaborate with NIH to do these kinds of things. So again, there's a lot of details in terms of it, in terms of what we have done. And based on that, we have actually developed this entire framework on using AI for measurement size, I think. So there are a lot of things. We do segmentation, tracking, feature extraction, prediction modeling, a whole lot of stuff in there. And uh, uh, it will take me about a couple of hours to describe this whole thing. And uh, if the, if for those of you who are interested, there is a website around here. Since these slides are available, so you can go and get it from that particular website. So the, in, in this case, actually, what you can do is that you can really, it's like a, 
just like Google Maps, if you go to Google Maps and you can go into a particular area of that map and you can keep zooming it, and here you can do in a virtual way the images. And not only that, you can actually do some very, very neat uh, kind of experiments with these local images in there, all kinds of machine learning kind of algorithms. And one of the things that happens with many of these images is like, for example, in neural networks, one major problem is you need lots and lots of data, billions and billions of images you need. What if you don't have? In some of these cases, what happens is you get the images, but the images are not many, but you get images in different dimensions. So you change the contrast, you change the some lighting conditions, you change some conditions. So those are the things you have. You have multiple, actually it's like having lots and lots of images, but only on a few images kind of thing. So what we do is that we use generative adversarial neural networks here to actually generate all kinds of other image, extra images. So for the neural network to learn really. So we used GANs. In fact, GAN is a very interesting thing. Again, I don't know why they don't use it very much. Is people should look into, people who are working in engineering design or a design should use this, look into this GANs a little more detail and see how can you actually use neural networks for design. So far, neural networks have not been used for design except for in this image processing. Mostly, most of the work is done in image processing. So you can use this uh, uh, generative adversarial neural networks to generate the images in the thing. So again, uh, I'm not going to do too many details of these things, but except tell you that we have been using GANs to generate the images. That's all you need to keep in mind. Uh, I'm going to skip this because too much in there. And there's another thing. Uh, 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 in fact, this one, the, the previous slide, let me skip it because of the interest of time here. Uh, there's another thing that we did here is uh, in the gastro, a lot of work we do is in the medical field too. And in this case, what happens is that uh, 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 people, the input-output system is a very interesting system, and we all have that, okay? Now, what happens is that people take what is, in the, if, suppose you have, uh, you, you're probably young, but a lot of people have this thing called GERD, which they have this heartburn, they call it, okay? So have you taken Mylanta, anyone, anytime? Heartburn, no? Kind of too young, okay? So if you're my age, you need Mylanta, okay? So you take those things for heartburn and things like that. So people do endoscopes and they put in the endoscope in your, uh, uh, into the mouth and they know what's happening around until this part where you hit the small intestine. Similarly, from the back, you do what is known as a colonoscopy to do, especially when you are 60 and over, you have to take a colonoscopy kind of thing to see what is the problem. In. But in between, actually the small intestine, nothing goes in there. So for that, they have something called the uh, pill cam or this capsule here, where you swallow the capsule, this capsule kind of goes through the entire system and it comes out. Now, the problem with that capsule is that they don't know, uh, the capsule kind of comes in and, in and out, uh, but then it's in the small intestine, and then the fundamental problem is that how do you determine what exactly went wrong where? And the thousands and thousands of uh, this video, about eight hours of this video which comes out. So we developed this automated algorithms where what happens is the system kind of goes in, uh, I mean, again, in machine learning techniques, it does, it does this feature recognition, uh, feature vector computation and things like that, and maps these features into what are known as ontologies. And uh, here is an ontology for uh, the uh, uh, part of the uh, input-output system. So we, we have this features vector that we generate, and feature vector is automatically transferred into either you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which is a part of this idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. So it's all this is done in an automatic manner. You just take the drink, the capsule, the capsule comes out, creates all these images. The doctor tell, it tells the doctor, you know, these are the problems that we have, and also at what location you have so they can open. Sometimes the capsule kind of gets stuck in the intestine, and then you can't do anything to open it. Kind of thing. So done, now it capsule costs about $600. Don't ask me what you do after that, okay? So once it comes out, what do you do? So that's, uh, that's one part of it. Uh, that's mostly in terms of the image processing kind of thing. So we use AI techniques in image processing. Again, this is using AI for measurement science. And ontologies are part of knowledge representation. You need that to represent a whole lot of things. Then we call this from Google to Panini, this natural language processing kind of thing. And uh, this one, what happens is, is the following. Uh, this, this is based on, uh, uh, on, on a particular insight. The insight is there are languages called glutinous languages, such as Sanskrit and other Indo-European languages. Uh, they are very good at developing this noun, noun, noun kind of combinations as such. Uh, like, for example, uh, English is not a, it's a non-glutinous language because if you have a policeman, you can have a policeman, but police dog is police and dog differently. It's not a single word. Right? But German, Indian languages, Sanskrit and all, you kind of combine these things in a certain manner. And how do you do that is an interesting thing. 
and, the, and, and, and I call it from Google to Panini, and the reason why I do that is because there's this, Panini is a guy who is a Sanskrit uh, a grammarian who developed this whole set of principles on, uh, uh, and, and the reason is that about three, 4,000 years ago, there the knowledge was transmitted by word of mouth. So in Sanskrit, there was no written things in it. So you have to remember a whole lot of things. So you have to remember police, every man, policeman, all this. So they can't remember all those things. So what they did was they remembered keywords and they remembered how to combine and conjugate these keywords into larger non 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 pace. And that's how they could transmit this knowledge over the years. And finally, the, all this knowledge was coded into this root and it's called a root words. And using several rules, on this particular root words, you generate some compound terminology as such, okay? So that's what the basic fundamental thing is. So in other words, we kind of normalize the syntax. Suppose you say an in initial frame of reference, that should go into initial reference frame, only three words here instead of this whole. So you can take the sentences and just take the compound nouns of those sentences which are conjugated. And what, it, what can be used? For example, search. And in Google, if you go and say BCC, you can do all of you have Google here, just say BCC and see what happens, okay? So, and then what happens is that it gives a whole lot of stuff around here, okay? All kinds of things it gives on BCC. But if you are in a particular domain, you're only interested in only a few of them. Like this IUCR journals, if you look at BCC, it's a body centric cube. It's a material science kind of domain. So it only gives relevant things. And even like filling up the things in Google, if you search something, it fills a whole lot of things out of that. So here it only fills the things required in that particular domain. So it's a domain specific oriented. Other thing you can do is you can create, we can go to documents, read thousands of documents and create taxonomies like this, for example, in materials. Is a reference material is a material, I think arrow should be the way around, standard reference material is a material, and all kinds of material taxonomies we can build automatically. Now, taxonomies and ontologies now are built by reading to the documents. Other thing you can do is document clustering. And that, have, that people do that all the time in terms of they have all these thousands of documents and you want to only get the relevant documents for your particular domain, especially when you are a journal person, okay? So th then again, we did this, uh, uh, norm normally what they do is that, let me just an example. People use these things called engrams right now. Uh, for those of you who you know, if you understand the common bag of words and word to vec have you heard of the thing called word to vec kind of thing, Google actually developed that thing where you take the words and form the vector representation of these words and you use that to go through the whole documents and then you can take, you can take the documents A, B, and C which are, where this word is there and they, how they're related together. It's a massive computational problem. And, and because of our technique, we instead of using the general engrams which are like a uh, general bag of words, all the words that you can com combine together and sending it, we only do uh, after passing it through the rule based, root and rule based technique, we have this compound nouns which you pass through it and the system does it pretty fast. In fact, uh, uh, if you look at it carefully, this is our system around here. In terms of the computational model, just using the technique that they use right now, it, this is the speed and the technique that we have, this is the speed right now. So computationally, this is very, very efficient kind of things and we're now doing tests in all kinds of things and uh, the stress results out, we'll publish them. Yeah. So uh, the complexity of this word to vec model, which again, Google has developed and it's used quite a lot, now it decreases significantly when the terms generated from RRR approach are used as opposed to the general continuous bag of words that, that is used right now. Uh, now we are doing some experiments with the track database at NIST, okay? So we have a patent pending for this thing which was applied last year. And now the finally in the next five or 10 minutes, I will talk about something called the category theory, which is a very complex thing around here, but I'm gonna go through it fast. So if you look at it, the future is called Internet of Everything, which is also called Smart Network Systems and Societies. In 2012, uh, the, uh, Professor Lewis invited me to give a talk on Smart Networks and Systems and Societies. So if you go back to your video archives, you can probably find it. Uh, I talked about the Smart Network Systems and Societies here, how the Internet of Things, how the social networks, how all of them are going to combine together to form this next generation system called the SSN. They call it Internet of Everything. And here is an example where you have hospitals, doctors, social media, and all of them interacting with one another. And again, just recollect that there's knowledge representation across the thing. So the idea is that for how do you actually make this happen? So to make this happen, there are a number of requirements around here in terms of model construction, uh, uh, integration, aggregation across models, model evolution. You want to be scalable. It has to be flexible and modular. So 
uh, what happens is in mechanical engineering, anyone mechanical engineers here or engineering undergraduate engineering background? So if you have undergraduate engineering background, if you're done mechanical engineering, they'll tell you something, uh, Newtonian calculus. Okay. The Newtonian calculus was we used to represent the language for representing mechanical states and things like that. And F equals MA is a classical thing. And you have the springs and masses together, and you can do analysis of those things. And Newtonian mechanics, of course, you get into quantum mechanics later on, but for things which are very small, but things which are of reasonable size in this room are cars, automobiles, Newton mechanics is pretty good. Quantum mechanics also is very, quantum mechanics or quantum computation is something which is now taking over the world. Uh, then uh, you have this predicate calculus, which is which are language and techniques for logic, and you have lambda calculus, uh, which is for computation. Now, category theory is an abstract mathematical technique that was developed uh, from some French guy about, uh, about half a century ago. It was pretty abstract, and it was lying somewhere, out, you know, I don't know, wherever it is. So we took that, and we are now applying that as a basis for knowledge representation. I won't go too much into the thing except claim that category theory can, uh, can, can provide a mechanism for integrating all these things into one framework. And there's a whole part of it in terms of, uh, you can, again, it's a few hours lecture. Now the idea here is to just give you an overview of what's going on and not to go into details of each one of them. But category theory kind of has this notion called uh, objects, uh, composition thing called operands. And uh, you have a, uh, that's a composition happens there. And you can take that the system that I talked about, systems of systems in the healthcare domain, and do a huge entire representation uh, using the categorical theory around here. Again, it's a representation problem where you have objects, and then there is, these are called arrows there, uh, a connectivity between those things. And people who, are, who have learned AI and semantic networks and things, so that it's kind of familiar, but it's a little more stronger than semantic networks. And we can also do quantum computation, and we can represent processes also in here. Uh, both the, uh, uh, the products and the processes can be represented in the single framework within this uh, uh, category theory framework. So there's a whole lot of stuff around here. I'm just going to skip the things. But what I'm claiming right now is that uh, there is this whole field called ontologies uh, where people represent ontologies, uh, knowledge in ontologies. And uh, like, for example, using XML or UML or model or first order logic, and uh, depending on what you want to do, syntactic interoperability, semantic interoperability, or something like that, you kind of choose the appropriate mode of representation. Whereas with category theory, actually you can do, uh, it spans the entire uh, ontology spectrum. For those of you who are into ontologies kind of thing, and I'm going to kind of move the rest of the things, except say that this category theory can be used for a lot of interesting things within the framework of uh, uh, AI, okay? So uh, I think, uh, let me just, yeah, these are some of the advantages of uh, doing whatever I put forward, model construction, integration, evolution, and all, and the, the category theory construction associated with it is each. This is the first slide I put towards in terms of model requ requirements of knowledge representation here, and category theory kind of provides you uh, with those kinds of uh, elements, uh, like uh, for modularity, co-limits, for scalability, functional program, blah, blah, whatever it is, okay? So now I'm going to summarize uh, uh, my talk in the next one minute. I think I'm going a little bit further down. So really we work on uh, metrology for artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence for metrology. Now standards used at the right time uh, will lead to innovation. So standards become very, very important, like this mu musical scale, for example. Once they introduced it, the innovation in music spread across. Uh, uh, it it, it kind of erupted the innovation itself. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we do, did in uh, category theory is applied that for Indian classical music. I'm, I'm not a musician, but one thing I can do is write about category theory for Indian classical music. So you can do those kinds of things. Now, one of the important things is that because AI, a lot of algorithms are there, one has to build trust in AI. So you need testing algorithms, uh, appropriate algorithms, so they can increase the trust in artificial intelligence. And the learning programs need to explain their reasoning uh, one of the other things you need to do is that public-private uh, partnerships may help to accelerate this pro progress, not just the private uh, industries or the government funding all the things, but there needs to be some symbiosis between the public and private uh, partner, public and private uh, industries, whatever it is, so the public-private partnerships may help these things. And uh, so uh, one, need, one needs to develop a set of challenge programs so that they can do metrics well. Uh, this is a thing called explainability, which I don't want to go too much into it, except that what has happened is that DARPA has a program called uh, explainability, uh, explainable AI. And if you look at the learning techniques they use now, neural networks, statistical model, and so on, 
And in terms of explainability, for example, uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, this, uh, the neural networks actually is very, very hard to explain. So they're around here. They learn very well, but you cannot really explain them, explain a whole lot. But on the other hand, uh, so some of these things like decision trees, uh, they are uh, very good at explaining, but they're not very fast at learning. So there's a trade-off around here. And DARPA has this whole program called Explainable AI. If you go to their website, you can see that. And it, uh, there are a number of uh, the ways of doing. These are all the projects associated with neural networks. There is this, this whole set of projects uh, with decision trees. There are some projects, model induction with this. So you can just go through this website in DARPA's website and see what are all the projects that they're doing in this area. Very, very interesting right now in the whole field of explainable AI. So in the future, if you think, see things like smart healthcare, you're looking at smart uh, devices, smart networks, smart processes, smart electronic uh, health records, uh, smart societies, smart, smart planet, and some of you, I think, have seen smart water also. So next time when you go to the grocery store and buy smart water, you're part of the ecosystem. Everyone wants to become smart anyway. So 21st century doc using AI techniques, robotics, and all those things will be like that. I kind of putting this slide for the last 10 years, but things have not changed anyway. Okay? So I'm going to stop at this stage. We have about 10 more things for... Oh, yeah, they said 12.20, so okay, I guess okay, that. Okay. So you have to be okay. We, we have uh, Dr. Redsham give us a lot of uh, different subject. I'm sure some of you may have uh, questions in some of the subject. This is a time for you to raise any questions. Any questions? You can send me email, my email address. Yeah, there. the email address is there. You see, if you, if you recall, I think that maybe you read it on Internet, in 2005, uh, when Stanford invited uh, Steve Jobs to go there for the graduation ceremony, and uh, afterwards, uh, young people like you guys looking for jobs asked him a question, uh, how do you plan a life, right? Everybody thinks he has a successful life, so he, he must know how to do the planning forward. And Steve Jobs answered Stanford students, say, life is not about planning forward, but looking backwards, connecting the dots. And what you see that uh, Professor Ranshuram did for us is looking back over the past 40 years of his life and connecting the dots for us. And uh, even ha as his friend over 40 years, and uh, I still find those, uh, those lines that uh, he connected for us very interesting. And you are still at the beginning of your career. When you look back, you probably don't see many dots. But make sure every day you do things, even you are students, you leave a dot on the ground. And then by the time you are our age, and you look back and you will see some dots, and then you can do the same thing as he has done so well for us today. Okay? So I want to leave everybody with One this. One of the things that uh, I would like to point out is that you have to think out of the box. Like I think some of you kind of uh, uh, are in part of the Ipodia core system around here. That's all. It's like, it's not the traditional notion of education is not the way it's going to be right now. The whole thing, there's going to be a paradigm shift on how you're going to learn in the future. So you have to think out of the box. If you keep thinking the same way, you'll be driving the same car for the rest of your life on the same roads. But if you think differently, then you, have, you will have paths at a tree. It's a tree. Instead of just a root going somewhere, now you're going on the tree. And sky is the limit on the tree where you reach. So I can see potentially multimillionaires in the future here. <laughs> if you look at our life, uh, 40 years ago, we were both graduate students at Carnegie Mellon. And that's where whole the AI, the actual, we took, I think I took an AI course, actually he was the TA. Anyway, so we really study a lot of these things, which today suddenly become a hot thing in all this, uh, in the real world application. It took 40 years, okay? And a lot of time when you start these things, you may really understand what's the difference because you have not really changed the way you think. It is very important, as he said, have different thinking and look at everything you do with a different viewpoint and given time, you will really make it big, okay? So this so, is... Yeah, in other words, you're the past, present, and the future. So you can learn from your past, keep going on your present, and innovating on the past and prepare for the future. So that's the key thing. How do you prepare for the future? Again, thank you. Okay.
This concludes CSCI 591 Colloquium on Monday, November 12th, 2018.